All right. It's good to see everybody this evening. Uh, it's uh, kind of turned out to be a nice day here in Southeast Kentucky, uh, Southwest Virginia. Uh, started off a little bit of cold, uh, a little bit of worry if you've, especially if you've got some some uh, plants out that are uh, uh, not very cold tolerant or uh, earlier we talked a little bit about some orchards as well. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and get started. And I'm hoping that you all will be a little interactive with this. And because we've, uh, I've tried to ask questions on this one here. So uh, let's see, is it still up there? Can you see my uh, slide presentation? Yes, it's not in the presentation mode, but I, we see the, the PowerPoint. Okay. How about now? Yes. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Phil. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about planting your garden. Now, this is a multi-series deal here. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to discuss this even, even more. And then on the end here, Shad's going to talk about uh, growing your own victory garden which is a really cool program that uh, the uh, University of Kentucky has put out. And then uh, I'm gonna to refer to some things in here uh, about um, um, pretty much about uh, ID 128, which is a publication that we use. And if uh, Shad, if you will, if you can pull up ID 128 and drop it in the text, uh, definitely would appreciate that. So uh, I meant to do that earlier and forgot, but uh, uh, and Phil, if there is one that is uh, uh, that is a good Virginia publication that you all use over there, go ahead and put that in there as well. So, okay. Uh, so I'm going to advance through this a little bit here. Now, the first question I tend to ask, and you all can type this in the chat pod. You can unmute yourself and answer it. Why do you garden? Why, why do you all garden? I presume everybody on here is is looking at gardening or currently gardening or or what have you. Uh, why do you all garden? Don't everybody jump at once. Well, Jeremy, I'll, I'll speak up. I just garden uh, for multiple reasons, really. First of all, I certainly enjoy it and the challenges of it, but uh, I'm kind of following in the footsteps of my father, too. He was a big gardener. He was raised on a farm, and he, uh, he, didn't, he wasn't a farmer for a living, but still yet he had that in his blood, so... I kind of was following him along in, in his garden when I was growing up. But I just uh, just get a lot of satisfaction out of gardening. It's it's relaxing to me and it's always a challenge. And, uh, and I love giving things away too. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I like that. Great. That's uh, that's what I was looking for, Jerry. Definitely. Anybody else? All right, I'll tell you what, well, here's some of the things that I came up with. You know, it's a, self, it's a safe and healthy food. You know, you know what you're eating. If you're, if you're out there growing it, especially if you're starting that plant from seed. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, starting from seed. So if you're starting that from seed, it's something that you can definitely, you know it's safe, you know it's healthy, uh, you know what you're eating. Or even if you buy it from a plant, you know exactly where it's coming from if you're growing it. You know what you're putting on it, uh, whether it be if you're having to put a pesticide on it or if you're having to put fertilizer on it that sort of thing whether you're going organic or inorganic fertilizer you know it's a you know what you're eating uh exercise it's a great form of exercise uh a lot of times it depends on how big that garden gets it will work you it'll work you a lot so uh it's a form of exercise stress relief uh you know if if you come in from a long day of work or something like that you can get out there in that garden and um, even though sometimes the garden can be stressful, you get out there in that garden and it's a great form of, of stress relief. It's something to learn. You can learn or you can teach something new. You know, one of the things that I found out is uh, it doesn't matter who you hang around when you're talking garden, you're always gonna learn something. But at the same point in time, you can teach somebody something new. Uh, like, like Jerry mentioned with these, I think you said your grandfather, 
uh, and so you learn from an early age, and and I'm sure you've taught some folks well as well about gardening. Also, uh, making money, something to make money. Uh, a lot of people use gardening to make money. They sell their sell their produce, uh, whether it be out, you know out of the back door or uh, through a farmer's market or whatever, uh, something to make money. But a big thing is you can also save money. Uh, it's definitely, if you're growing your own vegetables, you can definitely save money. And that brings me to my next slide. Now there's some, some economics of this have changed. The, uh, the numbers have changed, they've gone up and down. So you can put your own numbers in here or whatever, but buying a tomato, let's say uh, tomatoes are 219 a pound, which is about three medium sized tomatoes, we'll say. Versus growing a tomato, one plant's a dollar. You can even get cheaper than that. I've seen plants, I've seen some heirloom plants uh, uh, for as high as three dollars, you know, good size tomato plants. Uh, then that one, one plant there is going to produce about 25 pounds or 75 medium sized tomatoes. Um, you throw in the possibility of fertilizer, pest control, that may be a little high number there, but we're looking at about $1.50 per plant. So basically, we mentioned that three, si three medium-sized tomatoes cost two nineteen dollars versus 75 uh, medium-sized tomatoes is $2.50. So basically, buying a tomato, if you go out and buy one, it may cost you $0.73 cents per tomato. Whereas if you grow a tomato, it may cost you three, three cents or even less. So that's a savings of 70, 70 cents per tomato. So you're saving money through your economics of tomatoes. Now, the way I look at it, one, one of the things you'll find out in ID 128, the UK publication, is seven successful steps to, you know, seven steps to a, a great successful garden. One of them, I always tell people is plan your garden on paper. Literally go out there and we'll talk about this in a minute, but draw your garden out on paper. Select a good gardening site, prepare the soil, add fertilizer and lime according to that soil test. Plan only as large a garden as you can e easily maintain. That's where it gets into a lot of work. Also grow vegetables that will produce the most in that area you're working in. Uh, if you have a small area, corn may not work, but if you have a, uh, uh, you know, an area that's great for tomatoes or pepper plants or, or okra or something like that, that may be something that, that you want to go, go for. So grow the vegetables that produce the most in that area. Also plant during the correct growing seasons. Then harvest the vegetable state uh, at their proper stage of maturity. So we're going to design our, our garden on paper. Literally, this is something that I did several years ago, and I just kind of drew it out. It's nothing's to scale, but I drew out several items on, on just on a piece of paper. So you can see my planning date. Uh, now I'm one of the world's worst about planning too late. Uh, I'm doing better than I used to be, uh, but you can see I didn't get any, everything planted until the 21st of May. And then I also put out three rows of peanut beans or bush beans or uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so if you'll notice, I put that out and I wrote that down there. And also down there at the end of the row, I put out some pale pepper plants. I even put a price down there that I, evidently I gave $1.99 for those uh, green bell peppers. And then over on the side there, I put out some better boy hybrids, put out four there. And then up there at the top, I put out, look like four big boy hybrids and it looks like a Mr. Stroppy down there at the bottom. And then I also recorded my results, uh, everything on paper. I just kind of flipped that piece of paper over on the back side, and I put my first straight neck squash on June the 30th. Uh, picked my first cucumber on July the 7th. Those green bell peppers started coming in on July the 13th. Uh, so that helped me keep my information together in, in one spot. Switching gears a little bit. You know what? You want to look at crop rotation as well. What you did before, 
And, and this diagram is definitely going to help you. For instance, things like plants grown for leaves or flowers. Uh, you're looking at greens, broccoli, cabbage, and spinach. Plants grown for fruit, which is tomatoes, peppers, corn, and squash. That's, a, that's your, that's your uh, second area. Your third area is your plants grown for roots, things like carrots, turnips, onions, beets. Then you've got your legumes that feed the soil, things like beans, peas, and cover crops are in, in rotation number four. So here we've got a, um, an example of ro uh, crop rotation. So you're looking at year number one. In section one, we use their leaves. And then in section two, we use their fruits. Section three, we use uh, root crops and then legumes in section four. And what we did is we switched those up totally in the second year. And so basically, if you look at year number one, we did not use those again until we came back to year number five. So you want to look at some sort of a crop rotation. And I know it's hard. If you have a small area that you're gardening, it's very hard maybe to uh, do some crop rotation. I have one of those gardens. It's really tough to move things around. Uh, so it's tough for crop rotation. But if you can do some crop rotation, it's definitely going to help you in the long run when it comes to diseases and, uh, and uh, nematodes, things like that. So what to plant and how much to on that ID 128 to, that I mentioned uh, from Kentucky. That's a good publication. I know that Virginia has a, a publication as well. They have a home gardening publication that has some things in there of what to plant and how much. And those are, those are on those pages in there, but definitely check those out. So we're per preparing a new garden site. And now is the time to start looking at that, especially when it starts to dry up a little bit. Soil's a little drier than what it had been. So uh, basically, we've not had a lot of rain here in, in April. Uh, I think uh, the local uh, rain gauge uh, here that I use quite often is only had about an inch. Uh, 21 days into the month. So uh, you can start preparing now on your garden side if you've not done so already. So as soon as that soil is workable, go in there and turn that sod. Uh, you've got sod or if, you, if you've got your uh, ground prepared from previous years, plowing it, tilling it, hand spading it, whatever. Just start working that. If you can prepare that soil down to at least eight inches deep, great. I know there's a lot of soils out there that are shallow. Uh, I've gardened in some soils that you couldn't get more than about three or four inches, but try to prepare that uh, as deep as possible. Also, do not uh, work in that soil when it's wet. That's going to cause some damage to that short soil structure. You're going to end up with a hard pan down there on the bottom, and you'll end up with some drainage issues uh, in the long run. Also, work this area until the soil is fine and granular, suitable for the for seed bed. I'm going to talk a little bit about buying transplants. Uh, I know we've talked a little bit about seeds and, and, and growing your own plants from seeds, but uh, if you're looking out here and you're going out here to buy transplants, um, look for the healthy ones. And I tell you this because you're, it's your money that you're spending. Uh, look for those healthy plants. Uh, transplants that were seeded the right time and grown correctly, you know, they're going to be compact with distance between the leaves very small. Stems are going to be pencil thick and rigid. Leaves are going to be a dark green, large and upright. Also, avoid those transplants that are producing flowers or fruits. Uh, these type of plants are going to be slow to develop. Pretty much what's happened is uh, they, the plant is already maturing and you're getting, some, you're getting some growth there. And so the plant's going to start putting it out and uh, all its energy out into producing flowers or fruits. And so avoid those transplants altogether. Avoid disease transplants. Like I said, these are you're spending. It's your money that you're spending. If you have to walk away from uh, wherever you're buying your garden uh, supplies and go to another loca go to another location, do that. Uh, but get the healthy ones. So a little bit about transplanting. You know, try to transplant on a shady day, late in the afternoon, uh, early evening, uh, to prevent wilting. Uh, try to soak those transplant roots maybe an hour or two before setting them out, setting them out in the garden. Uh, that's going to help those. It's going to help less stress on, on that plant. 
also uh, dig a hole large enough to hold the roots. Uh, don't just push the roots together. Dig that hole uh, that you're going to set that tomato plant in or pepper plant in, uh, cucumber plant, whatever it is, uh, and then give it enough room and then uh, uh, press that soil firmly around those roots. Now there's a starter, you can use a starter solution that's in uh, that Kentucky publication, that ID 128. You can look at that and, and see about that there, but uh, uh, that'll give you some sort of an idea if, you, if you're interested in a starter solution. Also, you may need to water your plants once or twice during the next week. They need about an inch uh, of moisture per week, so definitely keep check on that. So planting, there's several varieties out there. In Kentucky, we have an ID 133, which is called vegetable cultivars for Kentucky gardens. In Virginia, I know there's a home gardening publication that's out there as well. That gives a really good variety of what to plant, when to plant, that sort of thing as well. So some things to consider, maturity. How long is, uh, you know, how long is it gonna take to mature? Uh, is it a disease resistant plant? And these publications will give you that information. Uh, or if you have questions about these, uh, give, one of, uh, give one of us agents a call, we'll be glad to help you. Also look at the size and the growth habitat uh, on the plant as well. So a little bit about the planting. I like to look at things about one garden, three growing seasons. Things like spring, summer, fall varieties. You may start out with some leaf lettuce. Work your way after it finishes, maybe uh, plant some late tomatoes. And then uh, before fall, late summer, plant some mustard greens. Those are just three examples right there that you can plant in one, one area, one garden uh, that you're looking at uh, on that. And that ID 128, it has that information. Also in that ID 128, as well as in that Virginia publication, are uh, earliest and latest planting dates. And it has it broken down into, I do know the uh, Kentucky publication uh, refers to as, uh, I think it's Eastern, Eastern Mountain uh, Range. And I know the uh, Virginia publication actually shows a map and it shows Southwest Virginia from like Abingdon, I think it is, seems like from what I can remember, the Abingdon area west, uh, maybe a little further out, maybe as far as uh, uh, Saltville, um, uh, Withful area uh, to the west. So that gives you an idea on the earliest and lady, latest planning dates uh, for that. So definitely follow those. Sow some care during the growing season. Like I mentioned earlier, about an inch a week is great. A water if Freak, uh, infrequently, but thoroughly. Uh, not necessarily every day, but you, you need to give everything some good coverage. Also, wet the plant. Don't uh, wet the soil, not the plant, rather. Just make sure you wet the plant, uh, wet the soil, not the plant. Uh, and because that's one of those things that um, if you get it on that plant and you've got a high humidity uh, in July, August, and you're having to water, uh, you're going to end up with some deep disease issues. You may want to look at it, some drip irrigation. Uh, we uh, covered that in a session back in the summer. Uh, and so that's something you can go back on uh, one of the Facebook uh, pages or one of the YouTube pages to look at. But, uh, uh, you know, looking at automated uh, drip irrigation. Mulch, whether to go with mulch or not. You know, mulch reduces uh, water evaporation from the soil surface, so that's definitely going to help. It reduces that soil temperature. It's going to help the plant there. Big thing is it helps control weeds uh, as well. So there's some types of mulch. You know, you may be looking at something organic, um, things like lawn clippings, but try not to use them. Don't, do not use those that have been treated, you know, with herbicide. Look at straw, uh, that sort of thing. Newspaper cardboard uh, or some items as well. You may look at uh, inorganic, which would be plastics uh, or the um, weed barriers that you know of. Um, I mentioned cardboard as well. Uh, just try not to use the, uh, the ones with the slick printed texture. Uh, but the cardboard, they do great. I use cardboard in a section of my garden around uh, some tomatoes and peppers one year. 
it works great. It eventually breaks down uh, in the fall. So uh, that's going to add some uh, organic material back to your garden. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, that's some things to, to think about there on mulch. I'm going to cover a little bit, just a little bit about composting. If you're looking at some composting, we're not going to go into it. We did do a, a presentation back uh, last late spring. You can go ahead and pull that back up uh, on, on the Facebook or the YouTube. Um, you know, things like adding uh, grass clippings, the straw, leaves, some eggshells, as long as they're clean eggshells, coffee grounds, vegetable scraps. You may want to look at some composting as well. Things not to add, things like whole eggs, uh, meat and dairy products, don't add those. Anything that's gonna uh, you know, basically rot and have a smell to it, don't add those. I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit though. I'm moving pretty quick through this, but I um, uh, wanna talk a little bit about diseases. Now, I think it's a uh, week after next or it's early to mid-May, I'll say. We're gonna cover diseases a little bit more um, but here are three that I commonly in my office that I get calls about blight and tomatoes, blossom in rotten tomatoes, and anthracnose and green beans. So had the prettiest tomato plants and then one morning uh, had this. Now you've got a couple of scenarios here. It could be late, late blight or early blight, uh, either one of those. Um, so you have leaves that are going to have dark brown spots. Disease begins on a, with the early blight, uh, begins on the lower foliage, just starts working its way up the plants. It's going to start to shrivel uh, and will die. Uh, some spray options on that, uh, spray them with the fungicide at the first sign of the disease, the first time you see it. Uh, use things like chlorothalonil, mancozeb, or fixed copper. Uh, that's your organic option, your, uh, your fixed copper. And there's some information in there on that uh, page 47 and ID 128 from Kentucky. Blossom in rot. You see this early in the season. Uh, black or brown leathery decay on blossom into the fruit. Uh, dark sunken area uh, as well. Uh, caused by variation in soil moisture levels. Uh, also, it's a due to a lack of calcium. And so as that tomato is forming on that vine, uh, and you have a variation in the, in the moisture levels. Uh, it cannot intake, uh, uptake that calcium and put it into that tomato. And so you're going to get a, uh, a, uh, that, that dark sunken area because of that. So uh, keeping your moisture uh, at that one inch level per week is going to help. If you need to irrigate, irrigate. Uh, so... Um, that's, that's definitely uh, something that you can control on that. Another one is anthracnose and beans. Oddly enough, I, I had a call from a, uh, from a lady several years ago, and she said she had bought a bushel of beans and they were beautiful. And I, the first time I'd ever had this question, kind of like this, uh, but she had bought the beans, they were beautiful, uh, she broke them and was getting ready to uh, process them. And the next day she got up and they had anthracnose on them, all of them. And they were in the bean and they had, they had literally come out uh, on the bean and started to uh, form on the bean the next day. Uh, that was odd, I'd never seen that before. Most of the time you're gonna see it on the vine. It's gonna be the, like, a, like it shows in that photo. Pods, uh, are, you know, they're gonna have spots that are dark brown, sunken. Uh, circular with brown borders. Uh, it also uh, occurs on uh, the leaves and stems. We typically see this from uh, save seed from diseased beans. So if you've got an heirloom seed out there that you're, you're saving, do not uh, save that seed from that diseased bean. Also use a, just a disease-free seed. Talk about the rotation of crops, rotate the crops, uh, applying the chlorothalonil or the sulfur spray uh, can you, be used for uh, disease control at uh, seven to 10 days um, of, uh, of the sign of the disease. 
Also, do not work in those plants when it's wet, because uh, all you, you're going to be able to do is you're just spreading that disease around the garden. So those are some um, three things there uh, that I typically see. So some disease control during the garden season. Regularly inspect plants for disease. Remove and destroy those badly diseased plants. And I know, I, you know, I, I talk to folks all the time. Uh, I know I've done it myself. You know, I've got this tomato plant. It looks great other than it's got a little bit of early blight on it, that sort of thing. I think I can spray it and I can take care of it and it just keeps getting worse. Well, the problem is, is it goes from that plant to the plant next to it, to the plant next to it. And had I just pulled it up and destroyed it, I would have been all right. So remove those plants that are having the disease issues. Controlling the weeds as well. Uh, controlling the insects which feed on the plants. Water and mulch to avoid unnecessary plant stress. Also use labeled fungicides only for control when needed. Um, and then I mentioned avoid working in the garden when the leaves are wet to reduce uh, the spread of those bacterial blots. A little bit on insect control. One of the things is a potato beetle. And here's some examples. There's your adult and your larvae. You know, be careful with insecticides. Beetles can develop resistance. And if you need to rotate uh, insecticides, do that if possible. Some control option B7. Bug Be Gone and Neem, which is an organic product that works very well on them. Uh, there's your bean beetles as well. Uh, the use of seven pyrethrins or neem as an organic option. There's some squash bugs. Uh, keeping the garden free of dead leaves, debris helps uh, to reduce those, removing reddish brown egg clusters from the underside of the leaves. And that's another thing on all your plants, check the undersides of those leaves. A lot of times you can go through your beans and you can flip those leaves over and you can see that bean bug larvae or you can see the eggs on there and you can crush those uh, really quick using a, a mechanical control and that can help in the long run. Uh, insecticides on these uh, for homeowners are not very effective on the squash bug, but seven and bug be gone are registered hey, for hey, that. Dad. So, um, uh, another thing, too, is cabbage loopers. We typically see that uh, in cabbage. Uh, can some control options be malathion, pyrethrins, or bug be gone. I do want to mention the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, some identifications there you can see. Uh, on these, uh, they have a white strip on the antenna and a black and white banding along uh, the base there, along the wing area. And we're seeing more and more of these. Uh, uh, the first time I saw a video of these things, Shad had taken a picture of it. I think it was up in Maryland. And that was the most impressive thing I'd ever seen with insects. Uh, pretty impressive. Uh, so there's some damage. They can inject saliva into the fruits and other par uh, plant parts as it feeds. The fruits become streaked with brown and white markings and spoil. Uh, and corn uh, pierces through the husk and destroys the kernel of the corn. Uh, they attack apples, pears, cherries, corn, tomato, peppers, you name it there. Uh, they'll get in the house. Uh, and so uh, they can uh, work on your garden pretty quick or your orchard as well. So definitely be uh, watching for that. Uh, there's some information in the Kentucky publication ID 21 that talks uh, specifically about stink bug uh, uh, in specific cultivars. So a little bit of pest control during the growing season, regularly inspect those plants for pests, control weeds, control insects which feed on plants. Also use in labeled insecticides for con uh, only for control when needed. Use recommended amounts, whatever that says on that, on that package, on that bottle, Whatever it says on there, go by that recommended uh, amount. Don't If it only says two tablespoons per gallon, only use two tablespoons per gallon. Don't go three, four. That labels the law, and all you're doing is you're wasting uh, precious money uh, on insecticides or pest, pesticides of uh, fungicides, you know, what have you. 
So I'm going to go into really quick here. Uh, and like I said, I'm just hitting the highlights because we're going to cover a lot of this more in depth in the next few weeks. So uh, just kind of hitting the, hitting the top here. So there's some more planting options using a container raised bed. You know, these things are they're great options there. And I know, I think Phil's going to cover a little bit about some, uh, some possibilities of this next week. Uh, you know, these are going to allow for gardening in small areas, places like patios and balconies. So, you know, choosing container size to match the plant's growth is great. Uh, also, there's some information in, back to that Kentucky publication, ID 128, uh, on choosing vegetables uh, for container gardening. Some sizes for plants, like for instance, a five gallon bucket is great for tomatoes. Leaf lettuce, you can use a uh, rectangular, uh, eight inch deep, uh, uh, container works great. Um, cucumbers, uh, you could use a rectangular um, container or even a, um, a five gallon bucket, three gallon bucket, four gallon bucket, that sort of thing. There's some raised bed examples there. Uh, wood, clay, plastic, stone, uh, mounted earth works great. Uh, and we're, like I said, we're going to uh, talk about that more in depth next week. Now, I will say, it needs more water, but uh, we'll address all of that next week. I'm just kind of hitting the highlights tonight. Uh, some things that are suitable for containers, you know, just about anything that you would plant out in the garden are going to work. You can make that work uh, in a small area. Uh, so going back to those records, we've got, we started, a, uh, we drew a picture of our garden. We kept some records as we went along. Those records are going to allow you to, uh, to know what vegetables you, you liked. How did that plant perform? Uh, you know, I've got a plant here. Uh, I've got a bell pepper that didn't do good, but I've got another bell pepper that did great. I've got a banana pepper that didn't do so great. Uh, I'm not going to use it anymore. Take photos as well. Put this information all in a, in a, in a folder, in an album, whatever, and you're going to use this information in the map of your garden for next year, and that's going to help with that crop rotation we talked about. So, I'll end with this, the closer your vegetable garden is to your back door, the more you'll use it. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And uh, Shad uh, and Phil have both put a lot of great information in there. Uh, those publications, um, ID 128, Virginia's Home Gardening publication. Uh, and then Shad put in there some information from uh, uh, Plant Paths. So great information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to hush here and I'm going to turn it over to Shed Baker, Ag Agent Letcher County, uh, to talk about Victory Garden. Well, Jeremy, you hit on a lot of the stuff that was in here, but there were a couple of things that I just wanted to go back and, and stress a little bit and add to. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the, the monthly cost savings, and uh, I think you referenced the physical activity, but uh, some things people may not know is that uh, growing a garden improves your self-esteem and it reduces stress and helps with mental health. And um, in light of what all has been going on the last year, um, a garden uh, becomes sanity for a lot of folks. And so as we go into 2021 and it looks like uh, we're kind of getting a repeat of last year, uh, growing a garden might be a really healthy thing for you to do. It can increase, it's, it's known to increase happiness and to uh, contribute to a good night's sleep. And uh, that is independent of being tired, by the way. It, it's not because you're exhausted. There's just something that is uh, deeply satisfying about uh, growing something, getting your hands in the dirt. And uh, this has been investigated uh, through research and, and they're trying to identify what it is exactly. If there's something about uh, microbes in the soil or, or being out in the sunlight, uh, but there's just something that, that makes people uh, feel better and sleep better. Um, it's also a, a good thing to do with your family. I could hear uh, Ava in the background and um, it reminded me of Alyssa and uh, the fact that she loves to start a seed and see something that starts from just this little speck and uh, to see the little uh, plant emerge and to grow into something uh, really remarkable. She was 
um, out there underneath some castor bean that I grew one year to try to keep the moles or the voles out of the garden. And um, she could hide underneath the, the leaves of that castor bean. And, you know, it, it started off as a, a, a seed that's, you know, the size of a bean seed. And uh, so that was a fun uh, thing for family. And it, it teaches uh, kids especially uh, to appreciate where their food comes from. It's not the grocery store. Uh, most American kids these days, uh, if they're asked, uh, they say that, uh, you know, milk comes from the store and, and lettuce comes from the store. And they have a total disconnect because they are uh, two and three generations removed from having to produce their own food. And um, I think it does something good for agriculture in general because it gives people an appreciation for what it is that farmers do. And so uh, it's healthy for our society overall. Uh, when people are too detached from the things that they rely on, they take them for granted and uh, they kind of get, um, at times I feel like they get belligerent towards uh, folks uh, that are uh, doing their best to grow the food uh, because they don't have any appreciation for what it takes to, to do that and the struggles that they have. And so uh, it's good for, for society overall. Um, are you all able to see these slides, by the way? Yes, sir. Okay, just checking. Um, as far as, uh, I know we've got uh, uh, one of Phil's doctors on here tonight. Um, a big thing that contributes to the health problems that we have in our country is a uh, poor diet. And uh, Jeremy stressed uh, uh, somewhat the importance of the healthiness of it, but I, I wanted to, to put that into uh, perspective. And I, I'm sure these numbers are very similar for Virginia. Uh, Kentucky's numbers might be a little worse uh, because we're a little more rural, uh, but only 8% of adult Kentuckians get that daily recommended uh, fruit intake. So 92% uh, is, is missing out on what they should be uh, eating as far as fruit. They usually substitute those sweets uh, with something unhealthy. Uh, so they give up the healthy fruit and replace it with cakes and candy. Um, only 6.3 get their vegetable intake. And so I think they replace those vegetables with French fries and potato chips and uh, things that, again, are not healthy. And uh, uh, sorry, guys, that uh, the tomato sauce on a pizza uh, probably does not count as a uh, vegetable uh, as far as healthy eating uh, guidelines. So, and, and they miss out on uh, some of the other benefits like the, the fiber, potassium, vitamins A and C. And so all of those are really, really important uh, for, for having a, a good, uh, healthy diet. Jeremy mentioned some of these, uh, but I don't know that we referred to these specifically, Jeremy. They actually have a garden calendar that we can get uh, at the office. It's kind of a dry erase type material so that if you are planting your own garden and, and growing different things, um, you can mark on it um, different little details, varieties that you grew. Uh, you could, I think there's a, a little feature in there where you can kind of draw a little uh, map of your garden so that you know uh, what you planted where, uh, that kind of thing. But um, we've got uh, these available. Um, th this is a little bit, it was from last year, but this information is, is still available. And um, the last thing I'll mention is that there are also uh, recipe cards and ways to use different uh, types of produce. Uh, sometimes in our area, people, if, if mommy and daddy or granny and grandpa didn't grow it, uh, if you, then, then folks have never had it before. And so unlike a tomato that everybody knows how to use that uh, for the most part, uh, some of the other options, you know, if it's rutabaga or uh, kale or uh, something that maybe is non-traditional uh, for the region, uh, you, you could give it to somebody and they just look at it. And I've seen this reaction from acorn squash before. And I thought that was a very Appalachian thing to grow. Uh, but 
you you see people uh, when they they see that squash, uh, you you give it to them and it's like you gave them a rock. They're they're not exactly sure what they're supposed to do with it, and uh, so these these uh, cards are meant to kind of deal with some of that, uh, so that when people uh, see the produce, maybe at the farmer's market, or if they grow it theirself, uh, then they immediately know how to use it. And so uh, spaghetti squash is a good example of one that I have seen people uh, uh, have it given to them and, and they're just, they're not sure how to use it. And, uh, you know, these are, are good uh, things. Sometimes people don't know what they're missing out on uh, and they're intimidated by something new. Um, but there are resources available. If you've got an interest in any of these, uh, we can uh, definitely get those to you. And uh, Phil, we're, we're always glad to share those across the line. Um, I'm trying to remember if there was, I don't think this is uh, web-based. I think we have to order each of these, but if you let us know that you need them, uh, we, can, we can get them to you. Shag, great the information. You you hit on a lot of lot of things there. Uh, I, I'll say uh, whether it's a confession or what, I'll say that uh, last year I spent more time in my garden uh, than I ever did. Uh, and one of the things is you, you mentioned my daughter. Uh, I I literally uh, uh, took her out in the garden, put her in the garden, and she she helped me plant. Uh, some plants last year. We started some seeds, some pepper seeds uh, uh, this year. So, uh, I, you know, we're looking forward to that happening. I really appreciate what uh, Chris and Dale put in the uh, chat. Uh, Chris mentioned that it was an enjoyable hobby. Dale said uh, the idea of growing uh, my own food. Chris also mentioned like to grow varieties not found in stores. That's a great, that's a great point. Uh, you don't go into a store often and find uh, pink beans and Cherokee purple tomatoes. So uh, uh, two, that's just two varieties that come off the top of my head. And so yeah, that's, that's great. But um, getting out there being, uh, and gardening is definitely a plus. Uh, but I spent more time last year in my own garden than I had previously, and, and definitely it was great. Uh, it may have been because I had a, a, a two-year-old up walking around and wanting to get out there, and uh, sometimes she liked to let, yank the flowers off the plant, which was not as good, and, and peppers the size of the end of your thumb, uh, but she knew where it come from. She understood it, and so uh, that gets back to teaching uh, teaching others, teaching the other, gener you know, the younger generations, hey, this is where this come from, uh, which is huge, so Definitely the great health benefits, awesome stuff. Greg, you that, now you can hear me. Um, you mentioned some of those varieties. I wanted to mention one to the Virginia folks uh, that they may be able to find over there. Um, I know Bill Best uh, always had these and I'm assuming Bria took that over and, and I don't know if it's still under that name on the website or not, but there's a variety that uh, was developed in Lee County, Virginia that's called Vincent Watts. And if you've never had a Vincent Watts tomato, uh, I highly recommend it. It's got tremendous flavor. It's uh, kind of like a really sweet apple though. It, it doesn't keep very well. So uh, if you grow it, you need to do something with it immediately, but um, tremendous uh, tomato. Anybody have any comments or questions? Phil uh, or anybody? Well, I'll just say, well, great, great job from both of you. Good, great information. And I like, Jeremy, that you mentioned breaking it up into multiple seasons, spring, summer, and fall. And it seems like every year I run across people who, uh, it, it'll just be early June and they'll say, you know, I, I really would like to start a garden, but I guess it's too late this year. Um, I mean, people think of if, if you, don't get something in the ground by, by April, then you're done. And I, I like how you divide it up. You can, you can get your summer crops, you got your fall crops, you can do. Um, so we're we're blessed, blessed with a long growing season here. We can do three different gardens in a, in a single year. Definitely. And I know, I know Woody's on here and I know he's had some success with successional gardening and uh, that sort of thing. So it, it, like you said, uh, people think, 
if you don't get it uh, in the ground in April, May, that it's, you're too late, nah. Uh, just look at that growing guide, that planning guide of what to plant. Uh, even if something comes up and you can't get something in the ground until June or July, there are some things that you can put in the ground uh, uh, even late. Um, that pink heifer under you talked about earlier, the, uh, another name for that is the six week bean. And uh, so that ought to tell you something about the maturity on it. It's, uh, it takes a little longer than six weeks, but not, not much. Um, one thing about the fall though, if you do try to plant things for the fall, that's uh, um, something that you can't afford to be late on. If you look at the, uh, the sunlight intensity uh, throughout the year, it's kind of a bell-shaped curve. And if you miss uh, the, those early days are the most important days uh, because that's when your day length is the longest. And as you get later into the fall, you know, it kind of falls off uh, quickly. So if you've got something that's not ripe, uh, the number of days can't make up for uh, the sunlight intensity falling off. So uh, if, if you know when those planning dates are for the fall, which should be in that, that publication that we posted, uh, don't be late on that. Because uh, you, you might find that uh, you're one week uh, short and the frost catches you. We've lost Jeremy. You're exactly right, Shad. Uh, you know, uh, looking at that, and it, it, it's it's huge. Uh, so, uh, uh, getting an early start, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, on your on your fall garden. Now it's time to even start planning on that. Um, Some things like spinach. I mean, you could do spinach right up until the the end. Um, I've carried spinach through the winter. If you start that in October. Um, you can have, uh, as long as you don't mind having smaller leafed uh, spinach, uh, I've actually uncovered it, you know, it had snow on it, and we just raked the snow off and uh, got lettuce or spinach uh, for the salad uh, in January and February, so. Definitely, you know, and I was going to mention things like, uh, you know, we had talked about last year, we talked a little bit about row covers uh you know uh, low tunnels rather you know you're looking at low tunnels uh, those are perfect uh those are easy to build and that that would carry that like you said carry things some things like some of your lettuces your spinaches stuff like that even into january we do have some questions that just popped up um joyce says uh isn't there something less deadly than seven dust we could use seven tends to kill even beneficial bugs um, there's a trade-off, Joyce, when you go to a, uh, I mean, there's insecticidal soaps that you can use for some things, but my experience is those only work for small insects like uh, aphids and such. Um, so if you, if you totally eliminate uh, seven and some of those, um, then the efficacy uh, falls off. So you, you might try to encourage uh, the beneficial insects by having um, uh, other host plants maybe around the perimeter of the garden that, that they would feed on and then come back in after the seven is gone. There's also some uh, sprays that are contact sprays. Um, and guys, well, uh, can you think of what those are at the moment? I mean, some of those per permethrins, aren't they like contact sprays? They don't have residual control? Yes. Yeah. So uh, you can spray with those and kill what was there, but it wouldn't harm your beneficials long-term. Exactly. And uh, speaking of beneficials, we're gonna cover beneficial insects uh, as well. I think that's uh, Tuesday after next. So we're going to cover some of those beneficial insects uh, that are great. So, uh, and then also Woody had mentioned Persephone days. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, less than 10 hours of daylight. It starts late November to mid January for us. So uh, definitely uh, uh, that's what you got to look for when you're looking in your uh, fall garden. Great information though. It kind of coincides with when the vitamin D from the sunlight falls off too. Um, yeah. 
for, and, for people thinking about COVID. And, um, ch and chickens stop laying. <laughs> that's, that's right. Everything needs a certain amount of daylight. <laughs> Let's see it. Let's see it. When people think about settling Mars, that's always what crosses my mind is not only is it really, really cold, but the sun would be very, very small and the, the, the light intensity would be very weak. So I'll, I'll stay here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good, great information. Anybody else have any questions, comments, whatever? Yeah. Awesome. Glad to glad to have the Bowles family. Glad to have everybody tonight. Thanks for the participation, uh, the information. Uh, like I said, gardening. Uh, we got some gardening. The next three segments, guys. Y'all want to cover that? I know. I think uh, uh, we've got Phil's big talk coming up on Tuesday. The one that I. Uh, said I was looking forward to on the unconventional gardening. So this is going to be like singing to your plants and uh, to see if it helps them grow. And is that what you're covering, Phil? Well, well, possibly. No, nothing, nothing too extreme, but we'll uh, we'll see what we can touch on. You wait till he sings, folks. It's going to be something you don't want to miss. Is is that better than an insecticide? <laughs> Very <well made. laughs> and then uh, then on thursday we have uh, wildlife management in gar gardens uh so uh that's going to be a good one to share uh, as well shad you want you want to hit on that uh yeah i think that's matt springer isn't it is, is matt matt springer from the university of kentucky He's going to uh, talk about the wildlife management gardens. Uh, so uh, uh, that'll be good. And then the following Tuesday will be beneficial insects with uh, Dr. Jonathan Larson from the University of Kentucky on that as well. So that'll Joyce, kind of want, Joyce will want to be here for that one because uh, Jonathan could speak uh, intelligently uh, on that subject. <laughs> Definitely does a great job. So yes. those are three great gardening presentations uh, over the next week and a half. So, uh, um, uh, I, I, and then we, later on, I do know we have a, a garden diseases, uh, middle of May, we've got a garden disease presentation. So, uh, got some gardening stuff coming up. So come back, join us. Uh, glad to have everybody this evening. Uh, hope everybody has a good evening. Looks like we, I know on the Kentucky side of the mountain, we we have another uh, freeze warning again tonight. They're saying down around 32, I presume, the same way for the folks over in Wise and Lee County. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, be watchful uh, over those plants, over those orchards, that sort of thing that you've got out there. Shad Field, do y'all have anything else to add? I don't. Great job. Very good, Jeremy. Well, good job, Shad. Uh, thank you all. Good job to everybody. Thank you all for the information. Thank you all for tuning in and uh, looking forward to uh, Phil singing to plants next week. So <laughs> everybody have a wonderful weekend. I think we're going to have some warm weather next week. So uh, uh, I think we, if we can get through another night or two of this cold weather, we'll be all right. So everybody have a great evening and a great uh, weekend, and we'll see you all Tuesday. All right. Thanks.